Let's begin. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience. We are honored by your presence here today. My name is Nadine Farid Johnson. I serve as PEN America's Washington Director. I want to extend a warm welcome to the US government officials and members of civil society who are joining us for this important discussion. As many of you know, PEN America is a nonprofit membership organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the US and worldwide. We champion the freedom to write and work to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. Founded in 1922, 100 years ago, PEN America is the largest of more than 100 centers worldwide that make up the PEN International Network. Today, we are marking the launch of PEN America's third annual Freedom to Write Index, a census of detained writers and the governments around the world that deny these public intellectuals their basic human rights. We will soon hear from Karin Karlekar, lead author of the index, about the findings she and her team have assimilated and analyzed. First, a few key data points to illustrate the breadth and depth of the problem. A staggering one-fifth of the 277 writers and public intellectuals currently detained are serving sentences of 10 or more years in prison for the writing and free expression. At least 11 writers are serving life sentences. Many writers who have been released from state custody still live under a constant threat of surveillance, harassment, and recapture. At least a dozen writers have been detained multiple times over the past year for their writing. And tragically, four writers and public intellectuals counted in the 2021 index died in custody, including Iranian poet, filmmaker, and 2021 Penn Barbie Freedom to Write honoree, Bakhtash Abtin, who died of COVID-19 in January, 2022. The, the number of writers and public intellectuals detained or imprisoned in 2021 remains intolerably high. And as the world's attention is fragmented in its focus on the terrible war against Ukraine and other atrocities, authoritarians and those who wish to join their ranks are conducting large scale unfettered efforts to silence dissenters. We are so fortunate today to have with us a panel of experts and people who have experienced the worst of these authoritarian governments here in our midst today. I'm, Please introduce them. Tatiana Niadbai is the president of Penn Belarus, a writer and a human rights activist. She'll be speaking with us first. Our panelists include Nime Ghasemi, who is an Iranian writer who holds a PhD in philosophy from Shahid Behesti University in Tehran and conducts research in the subject. He currently resides outside of Iran, fleeing the repression and unjust prison sentence that remains should he return. Zuhur Ilham, is the eldest daughter of imprisoned Uyghur writer and academic Ilham Toti. Zuhur is the author of Because I Have To, The Path to Survival, The Uyghur Struggle, an intimate account of how she maintains the strength and courage to fight for her father. Kakwenza Rikira Bashaija is an award-winning Ugandan author whose satirical novels and online writings on human rights and free expression have made him both an essential literary voice and a target of Ugandan president Yariu Museveni. Mati Da is a Burmese writer, human rights activist, and surgeon who has published over nine books in both Burmese and English. And Karin Karlekar is the director of PEN America's Free Expression at Risk programs and leads PEN America's assistance to individuals at risk as a result of their expression. I will now turn it over to Tatiana. Uh, uh, hello, uh, everybody. Sorry, uh, thank you uh, so much for having me here. Uh, dear colleagues from Belarus and I uh, are personally glad to be part of a, such an important document as the Freedom to Write Index. Uh, it is important that Pan America not only draws attention to the problem of freedom of speech in Belarus, but also helps to talk about this problem. As you may know, in the, for the second year uh, in a row, Belarus is among uh, the anti-top countries in terms of the number of writers behind the bar. Uh, it is a great strategy for us to talk about artists in this way, uh, then to call out and promote their new works. Uh, uh, I would now like to share some conclusions for from our latest monitoring of cultural and human rights violations against uh, cultural workers. As for end of May uh, 2022, uh, there are more uh, 1,110 
political craziness in Belarus. Among them, uh, 79 are cultural figures. A total of 98 cultural figures are imprisoned uh, or on house arrests. The Belarusian authorities continue to dismiss all those who are disloyal to Lukashenko's regime. State educational and cultural institutions fire, fire all those uh, who have spoken cut out against uh, the repressive regime and war. Intellectuals, teachers, musicians, artists, uh, tour guides, etc., are under attack. The authorities continue to put pressure on NGOs. Uh, as for end of March 2022, uh, 382 Belarusian non profit organizations have been liquidated. No less than 98 are directly related to the field of culture. In addition, on January 22, uh, a law came into force that introduced li liability for organizing the activities or participating in the activities of a public association that has a decision to liquidate. It is, for example, our Pan Belarus, uh, which was liquidated in uh, the last year and the previous year, and now all activities uh, connected with Pan Belarus are illegal in Belarus. This can now be punished, punishable by a fine or arrest for up to three months or imprisonment for up to years. Uh, our report will be in English. Uh, it will appear on our, in a few days uh, on the Pan Belarus website, panbelarus.org. And in this speech, in the end of the speech, I express my solidarity with uh, all the countries, with all cultural communities from uh, other countries who became the leaders of the index this year, as well as, of course, with the Ukrainian cultural community, which is now suffering because of the war. Thank you so much for the possibility to say this word and uh, good luck for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. We really appreciate your contribution and all the incredible work that you continue to do on behalf of Penn Belarus and the writers in Belarus. Now let's turn to Karin for a discussion of the top line findings of the Freedom to Write Index 2020. Oh, <clears throat> Thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. Um, and I will will try to start with just a, a bit on the top line findings of this year's index, which is which is the third um, annual index that we released just a few weeks ago. Um, really, what the main theme that we've been seeing, and this is this continued into 2021, is that writers have been at the forefront of resisting authoritarian crackdowns around the world. Um, and, and, and as a result, you know, they are being targeted for arrest and other forms of harassment. So we did see this sort of start of this in a major way in Belarus in 2020, as uh, Tatiana has, as re has just alluded to. Um, and in 2021, that really shifted to Myanmar, um, where we saw a, a coup by the military in February 2021. And writers were at the forefront of pushing back among many other groups in society. And then as a result, we saw a, you know, a crackdown that in involved the arrest and detention um, and other threats against a large number of writers. So Myanmar became the, the sort of big story in 2021 for us. It was the biggest jump, um, the top source of new cases in our index. Um, following the military coup, we saw um, you know, writers coming out in the streets and protesting um, and sort of using their, their writing and their expression and their creative voice to, to, to speak you know, about the situation and to push back against the military takeover. Um, and then we did see um, you know, immediately and then in the months following um, a jump in the cases of detention of, of a number of writers. There were, there were a small number detained on the first night of the coup itself, I think preemptively because they were known to be influential voices. Um, and then in the months that followed, you know, several dozen more. Um, and what we did see is that uh, many of these, these writers were detained for many months, up to a year almost, without even being charged with, with, any, with any type of 
in quote crime. Um, we did see also a sort of continuing crackdown in Iran. Iran was the second top source of new cases in 2021. Um, and we saw an ongoing sort of targeting of um, writers associations, including the Iranian Writers Association, um, where more members of the IWA were being taken into custody, including Arash Ganji. Um, we saw writers um, across Iran belonging to ethnic or religious minority groups being targeted. Um, there is a prevalence um, to charge Many of the many of the writers with propaganda charges or propaganda against the regime or other national security charges, and then we also saw the re-imprisonment of prominent dissident voices such as um, Nargis Mohammadi in Iran. Um, what we've also seen, and Nadine alluded to this at the beginning, um, was just the very worrying trend of you know, long-term imprisonments. And many, um, many of the writers in the index, about a fifth, are really paying sort of a very steep price for their peaceful free expression, which should not be a crime in any of the countries where they're being prosecuted. Um, we have 11 writers around the world serving either life sentences or effective life sentences. And, and really paying sort of the ultimate price for their peaceful expression. So that's another trend that we wanted to highlight. I mean, many, some of these writers are, you know, remembered and, and spoken about regularly, but many others are all but forgotten. And one of the goals of our index is really to sort of bring out these cases and, and keep highlighting these very egregious cases of imprisonment. Um, and then I'd also like to just highlight on a top line sort of global issue, um, just the threat to jailed writers and other political prisoners from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen um, in a number of countries that poor prison conditions and the denial of timely medical care um, can lead to, you know, jailing or detention actually becoming a death sentence for those with um, health concerns that get exacerbated because of COVID. Um, and we've, and Nadine has already mentioned him, but Bakhtar Shaptin um, is probably the most egregious case of this that we were tracking over the last year um, because of a sort of deliberate denial of medical care in December. Um, he, he eventually passed away um, in state custody in Iran in 2022, early 2022. Thank you, Karin. Can you Talk with a little bit, us a little bit about how these findings are different or similar to the findings in the 2020 index. Yeah, no, basically, I mean, we do, we do sort of have a top 10 list of countries. Um, and unsurprisingly, the, the, the number one and two spots um, remain the same this past year. Um, China really sort of stands out among all other countries in terms of having a lot, the, by far the largest number of writers and public intellectuals behind bars. Um, it was, it was 85 in 2021. Um, and, and that, you know, that is unchanged. And what we've seen in China is, sort of continuing crackdown against, um, you know, writers throughout the country, and then particularly um, a very large concentration um, of cases for the Uyghur minority, and that um, continued to be a very dire situation um, and made up a large proportion of the cases in China. Um, I'd note that, you know, many of these cases um, of Uyghur writers and intellectuals who, who are jailed or detained um, the, the, the conditions in um, Xinjiang are so restrictive and dire, and it's basically an information black hole. So many cases, you know, we and other groups don't even hear about until several years after the person has been detained in terms of confirming a detention or knowing that they're in state custody. Um, but that, that is a, obviously a continuing key concern. Um, what I'd also highlight in, in Saudi Arabia is, you know, they, they actually are... Last year, they released quite you know a, a good number of the writers who had been detained in previous years. Um, but what I would highlight with with Saudi is that many of these writers have been released with with a, a set of stringent conditions, which basically means that they do not have any freedom to write. So they have travel restrictions, they have restrictions on work, they have restrictions on contact with the media, and even you know, tweeting or writing or any form of expression. So although they are out of jail, they are, are definitely still in a, con, you know, in definitely a um, condition of only partial freedom, and they're really unable to resume their writing. Um, you know, other countries um, continue to be very poor performers. Um, we've already mentioned Myanmar, Belarus, Turkey, and then Egypt, Vietnam, and India, I would also highlight as, as you know, key countries of concern that remained in our top 10 this year. Um, Eritrea, I'd like to highlight because there's a, a group of writers um, that were detained. Actually, this is the 20th anniversary um, and they were detained in, in 2020 and 20, 
2001, and, and so this year marks the 20th anniversary of their detention. Um, and that is sort of, again, an, on, an ongoing situation of concern where there's really been almost no word about any of the writers detained. It's actually hard to even know if they are dead or alive. Um, because again, their situation is so restrictive and repressive. So those are sort of, I think, some of the, the key, you know, concerns and on, on ongoing issues that we've seen globally in the index. Thank you. Have you been able to discern some of the global trends or patterns in jailings uh, of writers you've analyzed in the index? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's interesting this year is we did see um, a, an uptick in and then in the when we when we look at sort of the different types of writers, we look at you know literary writers of all types, but we did see an uptick this year in both poets and sort of songwriters and lyricists being targeted for their incisive and creative um, writing and, and commentary and and, and singing um, and songwriting. And and so this was the um, the second most prevalent professional designation behind literary writers this year. And I would um, I would sort of credit that in a way to the the key role that poets actually play in, in the pushback and then sort of pushing back against the authoritarian um, impulses in Myanmar. Um, the the po poets have a long tradition of, of sort of resisting military rule in Myanmar, and we saw a lot of, a lot of poets um, either jailed and in, in a few cases murdered in Myanmar this past year. Um, Cuba, likewise, um, sort of singer songwriters um, and the artistic community have, have played a key role in sort of pushing back against the Cuban government. And we saw a number of cases in Cuba um, of, of writers and songwriters being detained. So that, that I think was um, you know, one, one of the, the changes this year and, and sort of an uptick in, in those, um, those particularly type, types of writers who were being targeted. The other um, thing that we were trying to look at sort of now that we have three years of the index um, behind us is, um, is, is just looking at this, this repat pattern in, in a number of countries of repeat um, detentions. And so this is a, a, normally cases where writers may be detained for shorter periods of time, but repeatedly over and over in a pattern of ongoing harassment. Um, and so in this, in these cases, you know, writers may only spend, you know, a week or several weeks behind bars, usually without even charges um, being filed against them and, and not sort of any sort of legal process or, you know, or sentence being, being passed against them. But they, um, it's sort of a repeat harassment, which really, um, you know, interferes with their writing, with their life, with their work. And we are going to be hearing from, from one of these cases, uh, Kakwenza Ukira Vashaija, um, as part of our panel today. But that is, I would say that is, um, you know, his, his case is not isolated. It is part of a broader trend. We've seen, for example, Michael um, Zorbo in, in Cuba, sort of subject to the repeat, repeated harassment and detention as well. Um, so those are some of the patterns that, we, that, that, that we've seen globally um, this past year coming up. Thank you so much. I really want to express um, how grateful we are for, for you, Karin, for your team and the, and the work that you have done in continuing to call attention to those voices who are being muted and, and silenced. It's really, um, it's really Actually, incredible. While I, while I can mention it, um, I would not have been able to do any of this without uh, Veronica Tien, who's um, my partner in crime on the index and really has played a key role in you know, helping to research cases um, and, and also analyze all the data as well. And it's, it's a huge job. And um, Veronica and our interns and volunteers have, have really um, you know, also played a, a key role this year. So I, I definitely want to, to give credit where it's due. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely agree. Thank you. So I'd love for all of our panelists to come on screen and we can begin our discussion. Wonderful. Thank you. So Kakwenza, actually, I will start with you. As, as Karin noted, the Ugandan authorities have repeatedly detained you as a result of your fiction writing. Would you share with us a bit about your novels and the Ugandan government's reaction to them, as well as your view as the climate for free expression in Uganda more generally, please? Thank you so very much. Uh, for a correction, I only have one novel right now, which is published, and it is my debut novel which caused all this commotion you're seeing around me. Um, it's just a piece of fiction I wrote in 2018 and published in 2020. And immediately I published it, uh, uh, Mr. Mseveni and his family, they 
saw it as an attack. They thought that I was, I wrote about them uh, without putting in mind that as a writer, I was, oh, my role is to reflect the mess that is in my society. So it is just a, a reflection of uh, what the Ugandan society is in general, the corruption, uh, the torture, the murder, the extrajudicial killings, what have you. Unconstitutional governance, uh, fragrant abuse of human rights, lack of rule of law. Yeah, that is uh, what it is about. And after writing it, and I got arrested and tortured badly, and sent to uh, illegal detention and then prison, where I spent about a month. Uh, when I returned, I sat down and narrated all what I went through in another book called Banana Republic, where writing is treasonous. Also, after writing it, after publishing it, they came for me and tortured me badly again another time. Yeah, for writing about what I went through. So freedom of expression, freedom of writing in Uganda really, uh, when you are a writer and you are a critic of government, they look at you as a terrorist. They think that freedom to write is only when you are writing encomiums, when you're praising them. They do not know that uh, freedom to write also encompasses uh, unflattering, the truth, unflattering truth. So when you are a writer in Uganda and you uh, criticize the government or you write a, a true description of who they are, they come for you and you face it. You face their barbarism. Yes. Thank you. For our audience, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the incredible courage of each one of our panelists here today to come in and to speak to all of us about the experiences that they have endured, that their family members have endured. Uh, we are truly grateful to each of you. I want to turn now to Matida and a quote from your keynote at the 2013 Edinburgh World Writers Conference, in which you said, for Burmese literature, creativity is not because of the freedom we have, but it is for the freedom we want to have. We saw one of the most significant crises of free expression in human rights during 2021 in Myanmar as a result of the military coup. You are a writer yourself and have been imprisoned in the past for your writing. Why do you believe that writers in particular have been targeted for resisting the military? Yeah, thank you. I think this is the point, you know, the whole general public, we never ever have a true freedom for decades after decades. So uh, not just the general public, but also the writers are looking for the freedom. And I think the, especially for the writers is interpreting what is freedom and making more uh, different opinion about the freedom for the general public. So this is the very, uh, hardest thing for the military to cope with, you know, they really hate any freedom for whatsoever for the general public. They just want, they even see the disciplined democracy. Indeed, it is uh, partly authoritarianism. They really want to introduce. So for that reason, writers turn out to be the people who can make such an impact, a very big influence on the way people look at their freedom, people uh, not just look at their freedom, but also to identify what is freedom and then to reach out to the freedom or to fight for the freedom. So this is the way, you know, the role of the writers in shaping the public opinion on the uh, freedom and fight for the freedom is pretty much blow to the military. So in that case, military has ever been uh, afraid of the writers who took uh, creativity in order to have freedom 
and still uh, they keep their own freedom in their own writings what, what, whatsoever the, the censorship has been imposed by the military. So this is how I think the writers tend to be the targets for the military. Thank you so much. Juhar, your father Ilham Toti is imprisoned in China and is serving a life sentence that was described at the time of his sentencing as unusually harsh and unprecedented. This was in 2014. Can you tell us about why he was imprisoned firstly and what both his imprisonment and the sentence say about China's policies on free expression, especially toward Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities, please? Thank you, Nadine. Um, my father, Ilham Tohti, uh, was an economics professor, economics professor at Minzu University in Beijing. Uh, he spent over decades in Beijing. And though he is an academic economist by training, he's also best known, as, as many of you are aware, for, for his outspoken advocate for Uyghur rights and for peaceful coexistence between the Uyghur people and Han Chinese. And he spent years sharing his academic findings, speaking to a journalist and writing articles in order to help uh, improve the situation of the Uyghur people. But now um, he's serving a life sentence in China on separatism related charges. In fact, he is the first um, Chinese citizen uh, who, uh, who was sentenced to life since the Cultural Revolution. Um, and Besides my father, seven of his students were also arrested just for helping my father maintain his website, uyghurbiz.com. And most of these students still remain in prison till today. Um, my father, even though my father was charged for separatism related charges and accused for being uh, someone who supports violence and extremism, but my father has never supported violence or campaign for separatism in his life. What he, what he was... Uh, sentenced for what he was arrested for was to practice his freedom of expression and freedom to speak, freedom to write. From his sentencing of, um, you know, from the sentencing of my father, you will realize that there's no any form of freedom of expression in China, no matter what we're talking about within the Uyghur region. Often people think, oh, because the Uyghur region or Tibetan region is far away, that's why there's more control. But as I mentioned, my father was a Be Beijing resident. He was a professor in Beijing. He lived in Beijing for most majority of his life. He was arrested and sent to, uh, sentenced to life. So there's no any form of freedom of expression within the Uyghur region or elsewhere uh, in mainland China. Thank you. Nima, like Kakwenza, you were jailed for your writing during 2021. Iranian authorities accused you of, quote, propaganda against the system, end quote, through your scholarly and online writings. As a philosopher and as someone directly accused of this yourself, can you share your thoughts on why you were arrested and why so many writers in Iran are accused of propaganda for their free expression? Thank you for your invitation. Uh, according to your reports, I came to know that poets and lyricists have been among the most targeted all over the planet. And uh, it's very sad news, but understandable because uh, because of their incisive and influential voice among society. Uh, however, just a few educated people uh, would like to see something philosophical, uh, to read something uh, uh, difficult to understand, a difficult analysis, perhaps, and uh, to hear a philosophical lecture or a speech. Um, in, my, in my own home country, uh, I could not, unfortunately, publish my already made books, just published my critical articles over more than 10 years uh, through Persian Time Media working abroad, uh, most of them located in the West. Uh, in addition to my Facebook page, Instagram and Twitter, you can guess uh, I could not be call myself a super celebrity or consider myself a political leader. Uh, uh, but let me say you that seven security agents attacked me in my own flat in the north of Tehran. And uh, they had scared my neighbors 
telling them that there is a womanizer, a sexual harasser in the apartment. Such a dirty lie, they said, uh, to come into the building. Uh, yes, of course, of course, <laughs> I, I, I am uh, a lawyer in, in the face of such a uh, corrupted system. Uh, when corruption reaches at the highest degree, every kind of people, every, every social group uh, come to understand everything better, I think. And uh, under these circumstances, socio-political reality uh, uncover itself. Uh, and even a philosopher like me might be dangerous. Uh, ironically speaking, but devoid of any metaphor or irony, uh, our society suffers from outcomes of an ideological revol revolution. Uh, and after more than 40 years, uh, we could not recover ourselves from such sickness. That's why so many people include, uh, including writers, poets, uh, philosophers, cry and protest, and uh, then put themselves at danger. I mean, very briefly speaking, this is a cor cor corruption in my country at the highest degree. This is the reason. Thank you. Hey, th there's such an interesting point here that I think we need to emphasize about the, the true power of words and, and the danger. When you talk about danger, a philosopher being seen as someone dangerous, a poet, a writer being seen as someone dangerous, that it is about the power of, of everyone on this panel, all of your words, um, and, and how those strike fear in the heart of authoritarians. And Nima, one more question for you, and before I can turn to the rest of the panel. In Iran, we've seen several arrests of writers who belong to the IWA, the Iranian Writers Association. Around the world, writers groups have also been targeted in Belarus, as we've heard from Kasyana, in Myanmar, as we've heard from Latika, um, and Nicaragua, to name just a few. Can you talk with us about the importance of a writing community and coming together to support individual writers who are under threat? Uh... Uh, you, you mentioned Iranian Writers Association. Yes, uh, one of uh, one of uh, its member, Mr. Bektash Aptin, you mentioned already, sadly died apparently because of uh, coronavirus in in Evin prison. I've been over there for for five days, and I uh, I know that uh, medical care. Uh, is very low here, over there. Iranian uh, Writers Association is a, a legacy of a leftist revolution in Iran. And then you can guess they, they commonly have a critical attitude, not only towards um, Islamic regime inside, but also towards uh, Western states, capitalism and liberalism. Uh, we had so many brave poets, writers, and novelists in this community, uh, which unfortunately could not support each other de facto, as far as I can understand. And practically, they practically face real uh, political dangers in Iran. Uh, uh, then uh, they are very vulnerable. So, such wonderful Western-based organization as Pen of America or other uh, other ones uh, seems to me a great help. I think all over the world, in any society, only a few um, percent of people actually grasp and confirm the dignity of literature and language. Um, then, um, okay, sometimes literature can be salvational, sometimes not. But uh, this is obvious to me that we must support each other as much as possible with any means, any device. Yes, it's very great help. Thank you. 
Karin, can you talk with us about what international governments and the United States government can do to support the important work of writers groups and organizations like the IWA? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I just to um, jump onto what Nima was saying quickly first. I mean, I do think, you know, Penn and the, the whole network of writers around the world was was founded in part just on the concept that, that writers anywhere who are free really need to be at the forefront of speaking out on behalf of, of writers who are not free around the world. Um, and I think a perfect example of this um, you know, concept on our panel is actually um, Matida, who was a political prisoner herself, you know, in the 1990s, um, and had many other members of the Penn Network, obviously speaking and advocating on her behalf, um, and now is sort of taking the lead and at the forefront herself, you know, now that she is in a position of freedom to be able to speak out on behalf of other, um, you know, jailed writers in Myanmar and, and elsewhere around the world. So I think that that key concept is what um, you know pulls us all together as part of a you know a community trying to support writers around the world wherever they are in you know conditions of being at risk or in jail or or facing any other threats. Um, in terms of what governments can do, both you know internationally, the United States, um, and then I'd also bring in you know international organizations and foundations um, to this as well. Um, I mean, I do think it's incredibly important, um, you know, on the government side for political leaders, government officials, and policymakers to speak out on these individual cases um, and demand the release of political prisoners. Um, we've seen in a number of examples, um, you know, in, in past years and currently that the attention can provide protection to writers in jail and who are at risk, you know, and can sometimes lead to their release, or at least, if not their release, to improved conditions, you know, within a prison. So being, you know, allowed access to visits from family members or lawyers or, you know, in some cases, better, better medical care um, or, or, you know, being taken out of solitary confinement, for example. So it is, it is incredibly important to speak out on these individual cases. Um, on the other side, I would say it's also very important for, you know, governments, international um, organizations and foundation donors to really to continue to provide funding and other forms of support to assist local civil society organizations, including writers organizations um, around the world. Um, these organizations are often, you know, really at the forefront of being engaged in resisting encroachments on free expression within their own country um, and in documenting violations of, of the right to free expression and attacks and threats against writers. Um, so these grassroots efforts are incredibly important um, and need to be supported, you know, by both governments and by other, you know, foundation donors and any other, any other, uh, you know, even individuals who are, you know, in a position to provide support as well. Wonderful, thank you. You mentioned Matidas. Matida, I, I will turn to you. You have an absolutely incredible and varied background uh, and, and your bio does not actually do you justice. You're a civil society leader, you've been a surgeon. Um, in, in the face of alarming violence and rights abuses as has been carried out by the military in Myanmar, how do writers and their writing support the population that's enduring for the situation? Well, right now the situation is really difficult and the military has been even uh, trying to uh, not just arresting writers, uh, killing writers. You, you can see uh, some poets has been killed. And when they send back their bodies back to the family members, some of the organs missed, that kind of terrible situation is going on. On top of that, they also try to uh, do the stop uh, selling their books on the bookstores or raiding the publishing houses and even the military seized some of the homes of the writers. So that's kind of things going on. That's why, first of all, the biggest challenge for writers right now is the livelihood, you know? It's really very hard for making their pieces get published. Even through the social media, it's very hard. They can be at risk for being arrested, killed, et cetera, et cetera. So, even though with this situation, there are some writings going on and, uh, you know, there is a fundraising events running by the Spring Revolution Group. And one of the fundraising tactics is through the apps, you know, click to donate and some other uh, YouTube, they can earn some money to support the revolution. In that sense, you know, some of the writings turn out to be the fundraising uh, 
uh, platforms, you know, so people can just listen to these and that uh, books, audio books, or the reading these books. And then by doing that, it can make uh, some money for the fundraising, something like that. So the, the way the writers contribute is not just through their uh, own writing, you know. So right now, some writers obviously taking part in the armed revolution. They just left for the jungles, joining the armed revolution, but not as the fighters, but also, uh, but, but just simply as the uh, kind of the archiver, you know, they went there and they have been noted out and they have been helping for taking the uh, footages, they having uh, write it down and they having running the uh, citizen uh, journalist based things, but not just the uh, journalistic pieces, but also some poem, poetry, and some articles, some writings, and this kind of thing is uh, pretty much running. And also, uh, I think, trying to reach out to uh, the people through small little events, but it's, it's not very, uh, like, publicly. Some of the Zoom meetings are just through the invited guests and expand the numbers of the attendees and uh, having kind of the social, psychosocial supports to the others. So this is how writers are coping. That's a really great point, mental social support in particular. Thank you. Kakwenza, you have also been a public advocate despite horrific torture and even kidnapping. And in an interview recently, you said, when you torture a writer, he bleeds ink. What is unique about writing as a response to such grave abuses? And what do you want readers and decision makers to take away from your own writing? Uh, <clears throat> denying freedom to write is like denying freedom to think or criticize. So I cannot just be there and whatever I write, someone somewhere thinks that I should write that, I should write exactly opposite. So uh, I could not stand or I could not uh, take the impunity in the Uganda society with equanimity. I decided to keep writing. So uh, get, uh, keeping quiet on the things that on the injustice that is uh, loitering everywhere. In, uh, for example, in Uganda is uh, giving an opportunity for the, their foolishness, their dictatorship to broom without being checked. You wouldn't have known that uh, the government Uganda, of Uganda could do something like they did to me if I had kept quiet to begin with in the first place when I had an encounter with them. If I had kept quiet, if I had not insisted, you would not have, though I see that it was kind of a sacrifice, you would not have known that the president and the son, they are as barbaric as, uh, you know, as they are, you would not have known that they can do such a thing. So, you know, imagine freedom to write without offending. Offending is also, part of freedom to write. So without freedom to write, we are maybe reduced to automatons, hmm? like robots. So someone cannot really think for me. Someone cannot dictate on how to describe the evils they are doing. You know, if someone is doing an evil, I must write about it and exactly. So you cannot just stop me from or you bribe me. Some of us, we, we write because we love to write and we do not write because we are looking for opportunities from the government. If I were uh, such kind of person, I would have accepted the political appointments they had given me, but I decided to stand my ground. And yeah, I have the, the, the writing is on my back and my legs and my thighs, but I endured it. and. Right now, I live in a country whereby there is uh, a lot of freedom to write. That is why I have continued to write. But if I had remained in Uganda, maybe I would be dead now. 
So freedom, uh, me deciding to continue the advocacy is because I want to live in a society that is absolutely good for my children so that my children would not have to blame me in the near future that my father was a writer, what did he do? My father was an advocate, what did he do? You did not really advocate for a better society for us. So I continue to advocate for freedom through uh, uh, using a pen, through writing, so that um, the future for my children is very bright. Our children are definitely motivating in, in, in making sure that we are working toward a better world for them. I want to continue on the theme of individuals who have been subjected to what you all have been subjected to or, or, or your family members in terms of having to live, being, being subjected to this and then maybe having to live outside, having to be able, having to escape. And Nima, you spent nearly three weeks in solitary confinement for your writing and you, since you have left Iran, being subject to a nearly five-year sentence. What do you think is the most effective thing people living outside of Iran or outside of their home country can do to support writers within and people jailed for their expression? And then I would love to also think about, have you think about what about political leaders around the world? How, how can they be supportive as well in such a situation? Uh, actually, I've been for four weeks uh, in solitary confinement. Uh, I mean, exactly 28 days. And uh, let me say, after fleeing from Iran, I finally managed to publish a post on my Facebook page about this personal experience, this solitary confinement. Uh, the name is uh, 28th Night. Actually, I dramatized being uh, quite unaware of the world outside, outside of jail. You know nothing what is happening uh, to you, to your family, to your friends. I could not even guess how many people really care uh, when you are in such a trouble. I dramatized the moment I came to know that all big media abroad uh, have reflected the news of my arrestment in Iran. Uh, and uh, dramatized as well, the role my girlfriend played at that time to save me, preventing me from uh, being forgotten, because um, uh, perhaps nothing worse than being forgotten, nothing worse than is being uh, forgotten. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's uh, you, you are still alive but it's a feeling like death. Then uh, I appreciate too much my people that supported, uh, supported me by publishing the news everywhere they could. Uh, then as far as my, my case is concerned, I have a great story published happily. So many people send me messages telling me that uh, we shed tears even before uh, reach at the end of the text, but uh, can understand there are subtleties ter in terms of security, um, in the security of people in jail and their families that all of us must uh, care about. Uh, in, in some situation, silence might be better, but as far as me is concerned, I appreciate every big media, every good friends and uh, um, thinkers uh, outside of country who support, supported me. Thank you. And thank you for correcting me on the, on the length of time. I don't want to miss a single day. Juhar, I would love to turn to you because you have unexpectedly now taken on the role of an advocate for your father. You have been writing for change and you, you're speaking before political leaders to urge action. Earlier this year, you testified to the Congressional Executive Commission on China and you said, we need to lift up the names of individuals who are imprisoned in violation of their human rights and draw attention to their individual cases.
can you share with us what you have learned over the years in terms of effective, what, what is effective in terms of advocacy and how your strategies may have changed and adapted? I have to be honest, I used to focus up until 2018. I only focused on my father's case. Wherever I go, I advocated for my father's release only. I even censor my, censored myself and try not, I tried not to comment on the general issue of the Uyghur issue in order to prevent causing further damage to my father's case or harming my other family relatives. But then with uh, starting from 2018, with more news coming out on millions of innocent Uyghurs, uh, you know, Uyghur people being locked up, hundreds of thousands of more families like mine being separated and hundreds or even thousands of academics, intellectuals, dis their disappearance. I, I just realized that it's no longer about one family anymore. And it's no longer about one single Uyghur scholars case anymore. And um, for, for me, at least I got to meet the children, the sister, father, or daughters of those detainees in the U.S. because of their family uh, members who, 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 who were made it in the U.S. or in Europe. But most people, they just have a ab very abstract idea of what is really happening in the Uyghur region. They hear from the news. Um, uh, people can be intimidated by the reported numbers of people who are detained by the Chinese government. And when they hear, oh, one million people, two million people, three million people, and people feel like, okay, there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do to help. I feel powerless. I'm just one individual person, one single person. How can I help release over one million people and to help release such amount of detainees? And that is why I emphasize at my CECC hearing, a, a congressional hearing, that is why we need to put names and faces to individual cases. We need to make people realize that all these people who are locked up, they were not just some fancy numbers. There are someone's friend, someone's parents, someone's teacher, someone's sister. They have blood and flesh and they have tears and they're experiencing pain. So we really need to lift up individual cases lift up my father Ilham Toti's cases, Rahila Dawood's cases, a well-known anthropologist, Parhat Tursun, a well-known poet, um, uh, Tash Plate, the president of Xinjiang University. We need to give those names. We cannot just say there are 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 scholars are locked up. We need to put names and faces to people's cases. We need to let people know these are real people who have families and who are suffering. And who don't have, who cannot experience all these positive, beautiful things that like most of the people who are in the US or in, 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 in those, uh, you know, democratic countries are experiencing. And we need to target those cases one by one. We solve these issues one by one and with effort and time, I believe, call me naive, but there will be hope. <laughs> because calling you hopeful and courageous. And I think actually that's what the index does quite a bit is to is to refocus the narrative on individuals. I'm looking at the people who have been detained and making sure that they are not languishing in vain. Thank you so much to her. I'd like to turn a little bit to how we can think about this from a broader picture. How can we have in, international political leaders um, and writers trying to push against um, back against authoritarianism around the world. And Mati Dahl, I'll start with you. You've experienced now two coups in Myanmar and you were imprisoned yourself in 1993 and later you received the Penn Freedom to Write Award. In recent years, we have seen multiple concurrent crises and resurgence of authoritarianism around the world. What do you think international political leaders should be doing to push back against these resurgences? Well, I think international political leaders should first listen, you know, that the very first thing is, you know, most of the time, I, what I feel is political, at least try to talk what it should be, but less to listen. So in this case, I want the political leaders to listen, especially not just from the individual people, but also from the organizations like Pan International, Pan America, and any other pan. The collective uh, leadership is 
pretty much uh, important in that case in fighting against the authoritarianism. So for that reason, started from the uh, listening to the organizations and focusing on, of course, individual cases and the uh, other uh, very uh, critical issue which can make a big change, you know. So this is very pretty much important is not just uh, listen to the media, to be frank, you know, right now the medias are either propaganda or commercially based, you know, uh, kind of the uh, uh, propaganda again, you know, either political base or the commercial based propaganda. For that reason, reaching out through the organizations like PAN or reaching out through the pieces of literature, through the pieces of the writings, because the, uh, the, the kind of the literature aesthetic ones are really reflecting the, uh, the ground situation pretty much humanely, you know? So that's why what we're looking for is not just freedom, but also the humanity. So the political leader should aim for fighting against any authoritarianism from the very beginning is listening and mutual understanding and mutual respect, I think. Thank you so much. And, and Karin, I'd like to ask you as a longtime human rights advocate, what role do writers have in keeping people engaged in resisting authoritarianism around the world? Um, I mean, first I'd like to just pick up on something that, that you have said as well. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's very understandable. We've seen repeatedly that, you know, crackdowns and jailings of, of individual writers, um, you know, understandably will lead to fear and silence and self-censorship both by, you know, the broader writing community and by other writers and, and by the relatives of those who are behind bars. But what, at Penn, what we've repeatedly, um, you know, heard from, you know, both writers and their relatives is that speaking out really does help and it's more effective than silence. So I do think it's incredibly important to, to get past that initial fear and to realize that in, in the majority of, the vast majority of cases, it really is very, very important, you know, both for writers and for relatives um, to be able to, to speak out. More broadly though, I think, you know, what we've seen is that writers are playing a key role. They always, they have, and I think they will continue to play play a key role in, in sort of pushing back against authoritarianism in guaranteeing, you know, our collective ability as societies around the world to imagine alternative visions of reality, to provide these sort of authentic homegrown voices that will inspire resistance, um, and to speak truth to power and to hold governments and other powerful societal actors to account. So that I think has always been a key role of writers and we've continued to see that, you know, in, in, in very present day circumstances um, in Belarus and Myanmar, in Cuba, um, now in Ukraine, Russia, um, and, and elsewhere in Afghanistan as well, which saw a big sort of crackdown on, on the creative community and journalists and writers last year when the Taliban took over. So we, we are seeing this globally and, and it's imperative that writers are able to keep pushing back and also speaking out, um, you know, to decry restrictions on free expression, the jailing of other writers and, and sort of broader authoritarian crackdowns. So that I will end there because <laughs> I would I would like for our the writers on our panel yeah, to, to have the last thank word you for sure. Uh, before we go to questions uh, from the audience, and I do hope you populate the Q and A, please, with your questions. Um, I'd like to pose one last question to the entire panel. We've heard from a couple of you about where you have found support since your unjust detention, um, or or in the course of your advocacy. And I, I would love for you to share with us from whom or from where would you like to see more support and how. and open up to anyone who is just to, to answer. Yes, you her. Um, my answer might, people might find my answer somewhat surprising. Um, well, the non-surprising part would be most of the support that I received were the US government and European you know, parliament, the European leaders. And, um, and I really appreciate that. But what I saw missing was the support from the business industry. And people might be wondering how is that related to human rights um, you know, situation, human rights issues. In my perspective, for, for the specifically for the Uyghur, uh, Uyghur uh, human rights issue, Uyghur crisis, the business industry 
somewhat is funding the current human rights crisis in China. And oh, we know that the for Uyghur forced labor issue is a huge issue. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a main part of the Uyghur human rights abuses that is taking place in China. And hundreds of thousands, millions of Uyghurs are detained. Where are they going? Forced labor camps. They are going through vocational trainings, including those, you know, writers and scholars, instead of writing in their reading room, instead of in front of their desk, in front of their, their libraries, in, instead of, um, you know, writing, what are they doing? They're either sewing, um, making a garment item, uh, threading, and they're making a piece of fabric, which is, you know, um, if that's what they wish to do, it is up to them. But all these writers have been trained for years to enjoy their writings, to, uh, to, 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 give, in, to give lectures. But what are they doing? They're all these, their rights for freedom of expression, the freedom of, um, you know, ri uh, writing, have been taken away and they've been forced to put in, uh, put into those forced labor camps. And how are these forced labor camps uh, being sustainable? Sustainable? Um, they are being funded by by um, uh, global corporations. If the corporations are not putting their factories, they're not functioning in the Uyghur region. They're not hiring those uh, Uyghur workers. That maybe. There's a chance that the, those Uyghur workers will no longer have to be locked up. So I would like to see more uh, support from the business industry, uh, from apparel brands, specifically since 84% of the cotton production of China is from the Uyghur region, and we know that most of the uh, most of the apparel pr products are made by, you know, uh, cotton. There's a huge huge uh, number of cotton that is amount of cotton that is involved in the apparel industry. So I really would love to see more business, um, you know, uh, support from our business industry in, in our democratic world. Thank you so much for that insight. And we welcome any other panelists to talk about where you have found the most support and where, from where you'd like to see more before we turn to Q&A. So I will say quickly um, that we have heard quite a bit today about the need to remember and advocate for the individuals who are wrongfully harmed, detained, or in prison. And one opportunity I would like to highlight both for members of Congress and for their constituents to support is via the Defending Freedoms Project of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. The DFP matches prisoners of conscience with members of Congress who agree to take up long-term advocacy on their behalf. And PEN America is a trusted partner of that commission. I want to emphasize here that Taking up one of the political prisoners' cases does not preclude an official's ability to support the release of others who are also unjustly imprisoned. On the contrary, I think as we've heard today, when you see that support, when that, when that, when that voice is leveraged and, and really highlighted, it highlights the humanity of, of these writers and it provides an additional stage that shows other prisoners of conscience that there is hope. I would encourage um, your constitu constituents to reach out to your members of Congress and for those members of Congress to take up um, these cases and become a part of, of the Defending Freedoms Project. I do so we have a couple of questions from the audience. And the first comes from um, someone who asks to any of the panelists, what keeps you going on a day-to-day -day basis in speaking out and advocating against often harsh and difficult conditions? In other words, what brings hope in your struggle? What brings you hope? Well, I think the situation itself, it's, since it is never ending and we how we can give up because the, our aim is just to change the situation. And as long as the situation is not changed, there is a hope to change and then we keep going. So. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to add to what Matilda said, um, yeah, the situation, the big situation is not changed yet, but every day we see a little bit of change and that what keeps me hopeful. Um, every year I see one or 10 or 100, um, you know, camp detainees being released because of the advocacy that, you know, the communities here are have been doing um, with our efforts just 
one of the families have finally gotten some news about their family members who were locked up or finally gotten you know some financial support or if all these little things it might be not huge but that's what keeps me hopeful whenever i see a little bit of positive change i just want to do make that little positive change a little bigger every day a little bigger and bigger and bigger and one day hopefully the big situation the big issue will be changed too and that's what keeps me going you know to, to the will for making the big situation become positive and a good, yeah. Thank you. Uh, for, for my part, what keeps me going is uh, the continued or proliferation of the dictatorship. The dictatorship in Uganda is not ending soon and that keeps me going. For me, I promised that I would use my pen to put down the dictatorship. After all, there is no leader, world leader or dictator who has ever won a war against the pen. So I believe that my pen will one time put down the dictatorship and I live or our, my children live in a, a better society. And Astrika Kwanza, thank you. That next question is, is for you specifically. Job Deganar from the Penn Emergency Fund asks if it's dangerous for you to go back to Uganda currently. Yeah, it is very dangerous because to begin with, I fled the country when my passport was confiscated by the court and they denied me the right to go and seek medication outside Uganda as the doctor had suggested. Uh, because of the torture I went through. So I, I fled the country illegally. I didn't have any document and found myself in Germany. Right now I cannot go back to Uganda. A series of arrest warrants have been issued out against me. So my going back to Uganda is dependent on maybe when Museven dies or when I sit on the table and I agree with him, of which I am not ready to do, I cannot, uh, me sitting down with him will mean that it, it will, uh, it, we shall only be talking about one thing, him exiting power. That is the, that will be the basis for me to sit down with him. Uh, um, if it is not that, I see myself maybe forcing, going back and getting arrested again from the airport so yeah, it is very dangerous for me to go back. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question, Nima, I'll pose it to you. If everyone in the audience could take just one small action today to support writers in prison and at risk around the world, what would you suggest? Is that directed to me? To, to Nima, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I got a uh, question, but difficult to answer. Because um, uh, the, the question is about uh, writers in prison or altogether, generally, they are asking, you think. Because uh, for me, for uh, so many other uh, writers or activists who uh, managed to come out of uh, danger area, uh, maybe the answer is different. And uh, about uh, the writers, uh, still in prison um, might be a different answer. Uh, as uh, I said, uh, um, reflecting the, this news and supporting outside of country of these uh, writers in prison uh, would be great help. And uh, what I, I've seen over years uh, on the Western organization part would be good because uh, it's it's very great to uh, uh, to see that uh, there are so many voices uh, in the world that can appreciate such acti uh, activities and uh, uh, tries to support. But um, I don't know. Uh, so many people like me uh, and. Uh, uh, Kakwensa is, is, is a little bit younger than me. We are uh, come out of our country and uh, I, I'm 41 years old. And uh, this is a little bit difficult to, um, to find myself in new country 
as a as an immigrant i mean and there are so many so many problems we would face the least one is a uh, economic one <laughs> to be perfectly honest the, mm -hmm. the there is concern about the future uh and the, i i lost my context the context which uh made me as a reader made me as a as an iranian who speak who can uh criticize uh his own country but i lost the context i'm in a very new atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, i i hope uh, that can you know, keep myself and uh keep going uh <clears throat> keep writing keep act, uh, active uh, to be uh, quite active uh, but uh, there are so many problems yeah. such a, such an organization and such uh, um, associations would be great help for such people like me and i know that uh, sometimes would be a financial aid that mm -hmm. is very great mm -hmm. right thank yeah. you thank you so much i am mindful of the time we have the honor of having kakonza do a reading for us all. So we will, I will turn it over to Kakwenza and we will conclude this discussion. Thank you all again so much. We are truly honored to be on this panel with you, to have you speak with us here at PEN America. And thank you to our audience members. We are really grateful for your participation, for your insightful questions and for listening. Kakwenza. Thank you so very much for honoring me the opportunity to read from my book. I'm going to read from uh, this book. I wrote it in 2020 when I came out of prison. Uh, the first time I was in prison for writing. Um, so I'll read from page 46. That evening, another officer who also reeked of tobacco picked me up from the interrogation room and led me to the stairs where he instructed me to stand and wait. I was only dressed in a vest and a pair of boxers. When he returned, precisely after a minute, he instructed me to stretch my hands to the upper rail of the stairs and he tied my hands there. Then he moved down and tied my legs to the lower rail. Thus, my body stretched between the upper and the lower rail of the stairs. Sir, you have overstretched me. Please loosen a bit, I begged. You are being punished for lying, for writing. I am doing exactly as they have instructed me, he said. So you are a robot being controlled by remote? I tried to crack a joke, but the person at whose expense I was doing so seemed uh, ignorant of my attempt. He hung me up on the rails and I started thinking about how they hung Jesus on the cross. Through the small hall in the bini, I could see everyone who was walking out of the building because the stairs where I had been hung were near the entrance. I could see the men and women in uniform some in casual wear and others in suits with their bags in the hands. They were sauntering out. They chatted away in groups. Though the vision was not very clear, I could at least see the blood still hordes of human robots hired by the government to dehumanize me. I had given up on life when the excruciating pain became unbearable. Couldn't even speak, so couldn't call out for help. My whole body had become numb. I couldn't feel the chains much as I could see that my bare legs and feet. I knew I was dying when I felt my eyes popping out of the sockets. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you all.